Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Winter is hard on your lawn, but there are some things you can do to help it through dormancy. Also, it's almost time to prune peaches, plums, and nectarines. We'll show you how. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. Booker T. Lee, who is a retired UT Extension agent, and Mr. D will be joining me later. All right, Booker. So we're in winter now, oh, right? Right. How do we need to take care of our lawn? One of the things that we in the winter months now, the one thing we probably start doing now is just walk around our landscape and see do we have any standing water okay. in our lawn. Because we got, we got standing water in our lawn now. You might not see the effect of it right now, but think in the springtime when that grass begin to come out of dormancy again. You might have wonder why it's not coming out so good. Right. A lot of times those roots are very still active during the winter months, mm -hmm. but they might be getting root rot. And because they were standing water there, you need to walk around your landscape and just look and see where water kind of standing. If you have standing water, try to get it out of there. Okay. Some kind of way, you know, try to improve that area where the water's standing. You might need to add some sand to it or some kind of thing to build it up some, but water won't stand there. Okay. And this is a good time, we always tell you, in, in, in the winter time is always a good time to do a so I knew you were going to say yeah. it. Because <laughs> right. you, you, right. you, never, you never know. We, we just can't guess at our soil and That's look right. at it and say, well, it look good, but the pH could be off That's right. in there. So you might want to do that too. Now, this is a good time to do that. And your, okay. your local state office has a soil box. Oh, and, also, <laughs> and they also they have an information sheet sure. to tell you how to do that soil test. And during the winter months, you know, it might not take as long to get it back. That's right. You know, if you need to add lime or whatever you need to add to it. A lot of times people, don't, people don't, they don't think about it. You, you don't need no nitrogen fertilizer in your, in your lawn this time of the year, but you still might need some phosphorus and potassium because in there. And this would be a good time to put that in there in, 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 into your soil now. Okay. You know, people might not want to think about that. And another thing about the winter, we talk about standing water in your lawn. All right. If we go through a real, real, real dry one, it don't happen too often now. It okay. might happen every now and then. <laughs> every you know, now and then. Every day might have no. <laughs> it might look kind of fun out there, but right. that, that grass needs some water. Okay. Those roots are very still active. In, in the soil, you know, they, 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 the top part just dormant because of the weather, right. but the roots are still active. So do we have the water in the winter, <laughs> is what you're saying? It, huh? it, it ain't like you, it ain't huh? like you water, you know, like you get, yeah. you know, like doing it in the summertime, but you might need to have, that, that's a real dry, that, that's hard to have though, but okay. it could happen, you know what I'm saying? Sure. You, you probably need to add a little water to it, need sure. some water to it just to keep that grass active in, in, in doing that. Okay. Mm, so yeah, don't, don't don't be ashamed to get out there with your water hole in one time. <laughs> in the water? Your, your neighbor your neighbor looking at you and saying, what what what, 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 what they doing? Just gotta but add a little water. Get that little water, just a little water in there. In, in there. So yeah, that'd be a good thing. So let's talk about the difference between the warm season grasses, which are dormant now, right. and then our cool season grasses. So we're gonna take care of those differently, right? right. Yeah, you have to. Okay. The, 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 the cool season grass now, they begin to grow now. Right. They, they, and let's they, give an example of cool season grass. Something like fescue okay. grass like that and, right. and they begin to grow. Kentucky blue grass begin okay. to grow now. That's some of the grass you might see now. Real pretty green. Mm -hmm. And normally you will see that somewhere up under like, a, especially with fescue grass, under a shade tree somewhere okay. to begin to grow in there. And then you might get the lawnmower. <laughs> you know, if you yeah, get real yeah. thing, you got the, you bermuda grass dormant, and you've you got two different types of grass in your lawn. You, right. know, you know, you might want to cut it down a little bit in there and stuff in there. Now, and, well, and, will those cool season grasses need to be fertilized? It'll need to be fertilized. Okay. They need to be fertilized in there. No, you might, they might need a little nitrogen fertilizer in there to get those to grow real good and, 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 and do that. Okay. So, the only thing about the cool season grass, sometimes it's, it's really good. And it might, it's, you, you might see it, it might <laughs> do a little color change sometimes. But we have a hard freeze or something, okay. in there, but it, 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 it'll, it'll come back and everything okay. in there. So, but uh, yeah, your cool season grass, it's it beginning to grow now. And we do have a lot of fescue lawn. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of fescue grass because people, people like their shade tree. And your moody grass or zoysia grass, your warm spring grass is not going to grow in the, under those shade trees. So okay. you need to make sure that you have that in there. And, and, that, and, and, cut, and cut your fescue lawn too. You need to cut yeah. it in there. Cut it to the right height. Don't just deal. Cut it too low and everything in there. 
How about that? Yeah. 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 See, I, I love my one season grass because I want to go dormant. Man, I want to go dormant. Yeah. I, don't no, want to I like cutting my grass in there, but I, I, like, I like to get the rest too. I like right. to kind of kind of ease yeah. back off of something and then don't cut it off right. all the time. I, I, I'm with, I'm with but, you I, but I do walk around my lawn now just to make sure, sure. there's no standing water and anything going on with my grass that I know is going to cause a problem in the springtime. No, that, that's good. So, mm -hmm. what about controlling those winter weeds? Well, the winter weeds, now, a lot of times you should already have them put some of your pre emerge down in there. But you can't go out there and spot you see some weeds out in your lawn beginning to grow. You probably got to have that many in there, mm -hmm. that, that many weeds out there. You go out there and pull those up. Okay. Yeah, a, a spot spray with some kind of uh, herbicide or something to kill those weeds out of there. Okay. You don't need to spray your whole lawn, but uh, right. in, in there. So just spot spray and pull those weeds out of there in there because you don't want those weeds to take over nah. in, in there. But you should be able to put you a pre emerge down already. Okay. If not, you might come back in the springtime and add you a pre emerge to give some of those weeds, some, some of the weeds from germinating. Okay. Mm -hmm. And always read and follow the label. Always read and follow the label. That's the right. law. You, know, you always tell that law. So you yeah. always that's the law. Make yeah. sure that you do that in there because you don't want it to go add too much in there. And in there. So yeah. don't read that. And a lot of times, some of the, what you put down, some of you might just need to read the label. You might need to water it in, not yeah. water it in, yeah. in, in, in there. So in right. Because it might be a granular or it might be a liquid. Liquid, yeah, yeah in, in, right. in doing that. Read the check, check, check those grasses out in there, everything in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what else do we need to do in the wintertime to make sure that grass comes out in the spring? Then like, make, make sure that you, uh, like I said, do that soil test in there and everything there. Make sure that there's no standing water in there. And there's, there's not a good time now. Maybe on your, on your, on your, on your fescue lawn, if you're growing real good and growing real good, there's no hard freeze expected okay. coming in. You know, you might, you might want to do kind of aerate if you know been native in the long time now, but don't do it early, early in the year, but you might want to look at and see how it compact okay. your grass in there. But, but but you warm season grass there. Just make sure you're watching it and watch for weeds and everything in there. So it should be ready to come out in the springtime. In there, but you got that standing water. Sure, yeah. and don't you don't come out late. And a lot of times, some of your zoysia grass might come out a little late. Okay. And and and, I, and all Bermuda grass don't come out of dome at the same time either. Though. So some of them might come a little later and everything in there. So you might see your neighbor grass beginning to grow a little kind of green, <laughs> and yours might be still in the dormant stage. So no, don't don't get don't get afraid about that. Yeah. <laughs> don't get scared and say, "Wonder why my grass." You know it's gonna be all right. You know it'll be all right. You know in, in there. So yeah. when should we fertilize the grasses once they come out of winter? Should we wait some time in the spring? Yeah, or? you want you want to wait till you start seeing that new growth in there. When you start okay. seeing some new growth come in there. And then you you, you zoil your grass. You don't want to fly to at least the first of June sometime. Wow, that's year. a good little one. Yeah, you don't want to do that, especially with the night and fertilize. Right. Like I said, your phosphomatasm grass in there. You need to fertilize that. You need that in like most of the winter time. But phosphomatasm can build up in the soil sure. faster. Sure. Your, your, uh, your, your nitrogen grass, your nitrogen fertilizer normally leaches itself out. Okay. Because plants use a lot of that nitrogen fertilizer in there. Cause it, only do two things, make it grow in tiny of green, so you don't use that lots in there. Okay. So a lot of them on your soil test, they don't give you a recommendation for nitrogen for that. They they give you for phosphate metasm. And also your soil pH and your pH the I mean the pH is so important to your lawn grasses, because it makes sure that it use the other nutrient in the soil. Right. And you get your if your pH is off, you start adding a lot of nitrogen down there, phosphate metasm that and your pH is off, a lot of times they get tied up in the soil and don't be used by the plant. That's right. And that's why we always tell you to do a, do a soil test because you don't want to add all that fertilizer to your lawn, putting fertilizer down here and putting it right there, <laughs> and just sitting there, just not just in the just stand in the soil. You want it for the plant can use that up. And that's why for most lawn grass, when you do your soil test, for most lawn grass, between 6.0 and 6.5 would be a good soil pH. Right. But that, that's, for your, that's for your warm season grasses and also your cool season grass. Huh. For it works you, for you, both. Yeah, it works for both. That's the OPA. Oh, and okay. that's why I swear. And, 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 and Chris, you know, you know $15 is not bad. No, no, it's, it's definitely worth it. It was yeah, the, it the $15 for the soil test. It's definitely worth it. Because you can go out and buy a bag of fertilizer, it'll cost you way a lot more than $15, and you might not need it. That's right. You might need to keep putting it down, and you might not need it. Yeah, it might not need that lime either. You <laughs> know, might not need the lime either. Your right, soil test results. Normally, you, you pH to stay there for at least three years. Once you get it where you want it, it'll stay there for three years. So you get it, when you get it to six point five, when you're in that area in that rain, it'll stay there for three years. So it'll be good. Be good. Be good. Be good. Then so you all right then? Fifteen dollars. <laughs> they might call you. You get to take it to the shipping boxes all, but right. the te as the test is fifteen dollars per box. And that's, that's, not, that's not bad. It is definitely worth it. Mr. Book, we appreciate that good information. <laughs> Thanks for having about, me. Yeah, taking care of the grasses in the wintertime. In the wintertime, yeah, yeah. So it can transition over into the spring. So yeah, we definitely appreciate the information. Again, if you need any soil test kits. You can stop by your local extension office. We have plenty in our office here in Shelby County. 
Thank you much. Enjoy it. Thank right. you. Desiccate. Desiccate. Yeah, desiccate. Yeah, that means drying. That's right. If you're out in the Sahara Desert, you're going to get desiccated. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, you're going to dry out like a prune. But in plants, it usually means that, and it, usually it's referred to in the wintertime on our evergreens. Uh, if, for example, the soil yeah. is real cold or frozen a little bit, the roots cannot take up water. Okay. because of the frozen soil mm -hmm. and then if we get a really drying northwesterly wind that we get in the winter it desiccates that mm -hmm. foliage in other words it's sapping the moisture transpiration rates go up and that's the loss of moisture from the leaves and that that is a drying of mm -hmm. the leaves for lack of moisture that's desiccation and it can be caused by a lot of different things happen in the summertime with a, a dry wind blowing and it just dries out the leaves mm -hmm. and it's lack of water in the soil you know, so in other words, you need to stay on top of the watering. Yeah, good examples. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Yeah. Good. And and once it happens, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. And it'll be on the north side of evergreens in the winter. You know, you'll see that people say, "What happened?" You know, but it's it's those drying winter winds when the soil is cold. All people don't think about watering their plants they in the winter. Not in the winter. You don't. Mm -mm. You really don't think about it. Mm -mm. And your evergreens definitely. We have dry spells in the winter. Sure. And then if we get a really really cold snap and a dry soil freezes. That's even worse in the cold wind blows. You're going to get damaged. Hollies, okay. you know, things like that. All right, Mr. D. We definitely thank Mr. Henry Jones for allowing us to be out here today. Super, super nice guy. And they do a great job with peaches and yes, nectarines and apples and strawberries. All right, so what are we going to do here? We are, uh, this is a nectarine tree. Uh, we treat nectarines peaches and plums the same way. We prune them to an open centered system and this is the way we open up the center. Oh boy. You see this is trying to be a peach, a pear or an apple tree. It has a strong yeah. central leader here. <laughs> well, this is what we do with that. Oh man, we're just gonna take it out like that? Kind of like that. I'm, I'm gonna be gentle. Okay. Because I don't want to injure any of these other scaffold limbs. Ah. We used to say these trees wow. Back in the old days, cost about two dollars, <laughs> and they say you take out about a dollar and eighty cents and leave about a dime's worth, <laughs> and you're kind of going in the right direction. And so that's what we're doing. Is it looking a little more open? Oh yeah, there's your dime's worth. It's a little low here, and and we've got three scaffold limbs, which is really fine, really all you need. And and you know I took off a lot of fruit. On a young tree like this, it's much more important to develop the tree, the shape of the tree, than it is to get fruit off of it. You'll have plenty of time to get fruit later on if you take care of it. There we are. How about that? All right. All right, Mr. D, off to the next tree. Off to the next tree. Let's do it. Okay. All right, Mr. D, we have here about a 10-year-old nectarine tree. And when I walk up to a tree that's got this much age on it, the first thing I look at is, has it got any broken limbs? And I see yeah. this limb right here has got some, yeah, some damage. Uh, and so I'm gonna take care of that. Uh, that's, that's in my mind. <laughs> I also wanna take off everything that's, you know, from my waist down. We call them hanger downers. I wanna take all the hanger downers off. And then I'm gonna take off everything growing back toward the center. Uh, I want, Ideally, I want every limb to have its shot at the sun. And so I, ideally, I won't have another limb shading another one. I want to take out limbs that are crossing over. And with that being said, I'm going to get in here and go to work. Ah, oh, he's pulling out the big gun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this, this limb has both of the broken limbs on it, I think. Yeah, it does. That I saw. It so does. I, I'm going to take that off and uh, I really think I can get to it from here. Actually, this is a little bit easier to handle. Yeah, I'm gonna make a, a little cut on the bottom because I don't want to strip out this tree. And then I'm gonna go up again about a half, this is about a half inch from the trunk. Okay. Oh, yeah. This right here, I want to open up the center a little bit. I'm going to take it off. All right. 
making these double cuts because I don't want to strip off this bark. Grab it, Chris. Right, yeah, I got it. I don't want to, I don't want to damage the limbs that I'm leaving. Okay, there you I are. I got it. Oh, yeah. And I like the, the shears that I use are, I like the, the scissors cut shears. I don't like the amble type shears. They do more damage to the limbs. And you, want, and you need sharp shears. Okay. This is, this is some hanger, a hanger downer right here. We'll take it off. All right, now I'm looking at anything growing back toward me, toward the center of the tree. I'm taking that out. Uh, I want to be where I can get into this tree from any direction. And I'm really, really thinking about taking that, <laughs> that limb out right there, but, but I'm going to hold off on that right now. I can always do it later. I'm also going to take out any dead limbs, like that's a dead limb right there. Quite a few dead limbs here, little, little dead limbs that were probably shaded out last year. I'm going to take those off. Uh, all right. I don't like to fight my way into a tree. So I'm going to open it up here a little bit. This is kind of growing back toward the center. Taking that off, this is growing straight up. This limb is crossing over, invading this one's territory a little bit. This one's growing a little bit more upright. Got some damage on it. I'm going to leave a few of these because there's some, ne there's some nectarines right there I don't want to cut off. This is probably a little low and that's growing back toward the center, so I'm taking that off. That's dead. This is a hanger downer right here, but there's some fruit right there, so I'm gonna take the hanger downer off and let that produce a nectarine for me. Okay. This is growing back toward the center, growing straight up. Limbs that are growing straight up, like these, I consider those water sprouts and they will not have any fruit. They'll, they pretty much rob the tree of nutrition and they're trying to be the central leader just like on an apple or a pear tree. So I take the water sprouts out. Anything growing straight up. When you have a lot of small limbs on a branch, I'll go in and like take every other one out to give them a little space. And as I go up on these limbs, I'll pretty much take everything on the top part of the limb that has a tendency, tendency to grow straight up. These trees are were bred and designed to be, uh, to be pruned. And if you don't prune these improved varieties, if you don't, Mother Nature will. And Mother Nature sometimes doesn't make as clean a cut as I do. She can, uh, she can be rather brutal at times. It's kind of congested here. We'll get all of these going straight up. Ideally, on a peach or a nectarine, when you're out here to the side, you'd like all of your fruiting wood to be from about your waist to as high as you can reach. Not much higher than as high as you can reach. Keeping in mind that when the fruit or on the tree, the upper limbs are going to come down some. So, so you can you can let that, you know, you can be a little higher than you can reach. You can do that. But and you notice, I'm again, I'm making a cut above a limb that's growing in the direction that I want it to go. Okay, Chris. I could uh, I could work on this all day. You know, it's like it's like a it's like a haircut or, or clipping a show steer, and you, you always see another limb you could take off. But got it opened up. This tree is really it started out. You can see all these trees are like peas in a pod. When they started, they cut them off at 18 to 20 inches, and 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 that's how the scaffold limbs came out at the right height. So they're really they've really done a good job with these with these fruit trees. All right, we definitely appreciate that pruning demonstration. All right, And again, you put in some work on that one. Yeah, I broke a sweat. <laughs>
Okay, I'm gonna show you how to properly plant a hosta and hopefully protect it from voles at the same time. The first thing when you get a hosta, you wanna dig the, your hole about twice as wide as the container. Then loosen this, you don't have to go deep, about three inches or so, and incorporate some good organic matter. Hostas are not deep-rooted plants. Then right in the center of your prepared area, you wanna dig out just like a cone shape like this, okay? Then we're gonna take a product. This one, there's Soul Perfector, there's Mole Go, there's a whole bunch of products out there, and just dump it right in the hole like that and make it, pack it up against the sides like this. We're gonna get a little bit more there, get in there. Now what this does gives you a protective barrier because when the voles are in there, they don't have any place to push that. So we're gonna make this cone like so. Then we'll remove this hosta from the pot just like this, spread the roots out a little bit, force it down in the center, and then we're gonna come back again with a little more on the top of it like so to protect the pip. Okay, then bring your little light mulch on top of it, the hosta's done, and you got pretty good protection against voles. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Ready. These ready. are great questions. Here's our first viewer email. What are these plants? They grow to about 10 to 12 feet and are spreading. And this is Ray. Well, guess what, Ray? That's what we call giant reed. Oh, giant yeah. reed. Almost looks like bamboo. A bamboo, right? okay. Loves yeah. to grow in wet soils, loves warm climates. Mm. It is a clump-forming grass. Okay. It grows by rhizomes. Uh, yeah, it has a plume-like uh, flower cluster can be very invasive. Invas what they do is invasive. Can yeah, be very okay. invasive. Take over, huh? Right, it can take over. Okay. Uh, again, yeah. wet soils. Wet soil, okay. Right, so you see it around a lot of pond areas, any area that's you know, pretty much wet, um, it will take it over. Mm -hmm. So beware, Ray. Okay. But that's what it is, it's called giant reed. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate that question, thank you much. Okay. All right, here's our next viewer email. I've just heard you say that all maple trees have beautiful color during autumn, but our 30-year-old maple tree's leaves just shrivel up and turn brown. Our maple trees don't turn red in the fall. Should the pH of our soil be checked? Please advise, and this is Darlene. So Mary, you have anything, any, any comments on that one? Yeah, you know, it could just be that the tree's getting old. It could be. Um, Trees, like everything else, have a lifespan. Yes. And so sometimes as they get older, they're prone to um, developing some issues. I would agree with that. Yeah, like she said, maple tree, they, 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 they lifespan, and they're not, some of them might not, not, not as long. Right. You know, that could be the problem that, that, that they're getting old, just getting old, you know, and just stop producing them, those blooms on there. And, this, and sometimes maybe through a really drought, there might be some problem why they might not be able could to be. put on, on there and, and so around there. But the age of the tree, and then, and, and then look at look around the tree. And look at a lot of branch on your maple tree and see how they, how it how they begin to look. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I would advise doing as well because yeah, she said the leaves are shriveling up mm -hmm. and they just turn brown. Yeah. So I'm thinking could it be a disease? disease yeah. Could it be wood borers? Mm -hmm. uh, it is a 30 year old tree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, age is something that I would be age, concerned yeah. about as well. If you want to check the pH, I mean, yeah, we're not going to say you can't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely can. Go to your local extension office and uh, get a soil test kit. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking about that, and yeah. usually when you think about leaves turning colors, that has more to do with the temperature, the temperature, weather. Weather, yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah, again, it's 30 year old tree, so yeah, it could be some issues. Yeah. It could they, be some issues. They in the, the past, the lifespans, yeah. man. Yeah, so. 30 years old. 30 years I mean, old. You got so. a lot of that tree, Miss Darlene. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that question. Good luck to you. All right, here's our next viewer email. Mm -hmm. Can you please recommend how to care for my winter pansies? This is my first time trying these. I live in southern New Jersey. I planted them September 10th. This is Glenn on YouTube. So congratulations, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, your first winter pansies. All right, Mr. Booker, how does he need to take care of those winter Man, pansies? I, I like winter pansies. <laughs> I, like, I like pansies, and I'm gonna take care of themselves. Right, right, <laughs> you know, right. I know when, they, when I put them out in my yard, they just snow get them, ice get them, they still survive. Right. And they really want you to make sure you got no standing water around your pansies. Yeah. You know, that's all you want to make sure you got no standing water. And they should do well, and they should take right. care of themselves and everything. They, 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 every now and then you might want to give them just a little fertilizer around there, but that, that's it for the pans. They, they do good. Pans and Viola, they, they, they really, they're really tough. They do good. Mm -hmm. uh, you're exactly right. Mary, anything you want to add to that? No, I think good luck. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, but yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, just make sure you know, it's not too moist because uh, yeah. the roots will rot. Real rot on you. Okay. Yeah, don't yeah. bury the crown or anything mm -hmm. like that. You can use a slow release so fertilizer. Like or something like right. that, yeah, whatever. You Mulch it. Yep, yeah. And it should be good. It should be good, yeah. yeah. So good luck to you, Glenn. We appreciate that question. 
Uh, here's our next via email. I planted a sweet bay magnolia two years ago and it's doing great. This summer we had a heat wave in Memphis and I'm curious how much watering I should do to keep a young sweet bay magnolia healthy. And this is Rick from YouTube. So Mary, you have any thoughts about trying to keep that sweet bay magnolia healthy? I think it's a great tree. I think um, it's a great tree. Yeah, yeah uh, so great choice on the tree. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's still kind of young, so during droughts, you might want to give it a little bit of water I'm sure. just to help it get established. Yeah. Okay, I can go with that. Yeah, but that's the same thing, same question though. A lot of times you treat probably about an inch of water a week or something like that okay. and try to do that one time and if you run off, start back again. But I like a sweet baby note too. I had one of my yard. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah, good yeah, trees. Yeah, I like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, definitely have to keep it watered during drought like mm -hmm. conditions. It says two years old here. Uh, we did have a heat wave. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I heard recently it's one of the second hottest summer oh, yeah. uh, in Shelby County in Memphis. Uh, so you definitely want to, you know, keep it water during the drought. And then sweet baby magnolias, another name for sweet baby magnolias are swamp magnolias. Mm -hmm. It's all in the name, swamp. Yep. <laughs> so it likes moist mm -hmm. soils, but those soils have to be well drained yes. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sweet baby magnolia, swamp magnolia. So make sure it gets the water that it needs. It should be just fine. I think we all. Enjoy sweet baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, so thank you for your question. We appreciate that. So, Mr. Booker, Mary, we out of time. Thank you much. It was thank fun. You. Enjoy it, Dan. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about anything we talked about today, go to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.